salvage hunters. Drew visits a young American dealer now based in Suffolk. I moved to the UK about 12 years ago for yeah. work. I was working in finance at the time. So you went from banking to the guaranteed way how to lose money? Yeah, <laughs> basically. In a stately home in Cornwall, Drew needs to stick to his guns. I bought some of these for 1,200 quid. Really? Yeah. Well, these are more expensive. They're rather more finely done. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> <laughs> and with some young traders getting started in Dorset... How old are you? 26. I feel really old. He finds a classic early 20th century masterpiece. Even now talking about it, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up because it's just so damn good. Drew Pritchard is one of Britain's leading decorative salvage dealers. Whoa, this is great. What a wonderful house. He's on a hunt for weird and wonderful objects. I'm like that. Oh, it's a stonker and it's really beautiful. It's a brilliant piece of engineering. In his search for treasure... Wow, it's hot in here. Oh, now you're talking. He bargains hard. 200 quid. I've got to ask. And there's nothing he won't buy. Sold. With help from Rebecca... The money's in that one. Absolutely. Well, I never. And a team of renovators... I can see some gold. He transforms thousands of items, from junk to gems. The antiques trade has evolved in recent years, with more and more being bought and sold online and through social platforms. Online trading has changed absolutely everything. It's become the prime medium for selling antiques. I think not just in this country, in the world. You also get the opportunity to create your own world and your own look, and you can be really successful with that. Today, Drew and T are traveling 270 miles southeast to visit the latest of this new breed of antique dealer, who use their homes as a shop window and in-person visits are by appointment only. Today, T, we are in Suffolk and we're off to meet Ambrice, uh, who runs Relic Interiors, and she has a really good Instagram internet presence. She has a very particular look, all of her own, and uh, while we're in the area, we're gonna put um, a face to the name. Oh, excellent. Suffolk is a landscape made famous by two quintessentially English artists, Thomas Gainsborough and John Constable. Drew and T are heading to a picturesque village where Relic Interiors was set up three years ago as an exclusively online business. But Drew and T have secured a rare invite to this historic 17th century home from Relic's founder, Ambrose Miller. I deal in anything from classical to kitsch, so <laughs> and that's primarily driven because I want to live with beautiful things and I want to share beautiful things. The way that I like to use our house is really to stage a lot of the pieces. It just gives customers a context of what they're buying and also how they can style it themselves. You know, when they say, get up and you smile about what you're about to do that day, it's a good day. Um, and that's what I feel with Relic, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I like the door colour. Hi. Hello, how Hello. are you guys doing? Right, thank you, thank you. You want to come on in? Yes, please. Let's go. We've got some stock for us to see. Yes, indeed. Okay. So, welcome to our home. Thank, well, thanks. This is nice. nice. Lovely. Of course. Going into antique dealers' houses, it's just fascinating. All you know? the best stock's always in the house. Yeah. yeah. Look, I'm going to be honest, right? I'm going to poke around everywhere. So, here's just the dining room. Whoa. Great, look. You really love what you do, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. It's... We can tell. <laughs> <laughs> You're very good at what you do as well. Yeah, it's good. Thank it's you. It's really good. Thank you, thank you. Did you come from a very large house? <laughs> well, a lot of the houses in America are quite big. You need a bigger um, house now, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> You've outgrown this one. Yeah. We're beginning today in Ambrice's house, and um, it's lovely. It's a singular vision, and I like it when people do that. She's great. She's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> How long do I have to sit for her again? Well, she looks like me when I start to get hangry. And we're in a really old house in a really old-fashioned village, and it's got this incredible style, and it looks thrown together, and it really isn't. It takes a lot to throw something like this together. This is great. Mm. So this is one of the other sitting rooms, and again, just use the space to 
stage a lot of the pieces that are for sale. And Briss is fairly new to the business. She's been doing about three years, but she's already an established name online and has her business all over social media. That's where I found her, and she's very good at it, and that is becoming a big skill base. It's something you've got to get on board with. You know, it's about the best thing that's happened to the antiques trade. Loads of people complain about it. Let them complain. They ain't going to be around that long. Get into it, get on with it, learn everything you can about it, and use it to your best advantage. And that's clearly what she's done. OK, so these are your outbuildings? Yes, where I keep the majority of the stock. OK. Um, and, again, kind of appointment only. Well, this looks great. Can I have a quick, yeah, um, of quick course. look around? Just have a peruse and feel I free. Will. There's There's a lot of stuff behind and tucked away. Did you move here for antique work? What did you do? I moved to the UK about 12 years ago for yeah. work. I was working in finance at the time. Uh -huh. Fell in love with it, and I've been here ever since. So you went from banking to the guaranteed way how to lose money? Yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> it's great to see a singular passion, because it's very, very easy to get diluted these days. Nobody else could have put this room together, bar Ambrise. You really do like faux bamboo, don't you? It's an like obsession. A it's an obsession. That and bobbin, <laughs> I would say. Um, and bobbins, you got some bobbin stuff. I do. I'm a big buyer of bobbins. I, I mean, you're in the right place then. Yeah, up there. <laughs> bobbin world. <laughs> world oh, yeah. of bobbins. Oh my, how many bobbin chairs you got? One. It's a slight obsession. Two, three, four, five. <laughs> Just a little bit. Six, of seven, eight, nine. You've got ten that I can see up here. Do we need to talk about this? Maybe. <laughs> we need to have a, we need to have a chat. <laughs> the earliest bobbin furniture dates back to the 17th century, but it became much easier to produce in Victorian times with the introduction of the machine lathe. That's unusual. Combination of bobbin and faux bamboo. Look at yeah. that. Yeah. Is that your favourite thing? That's my favourite <laughs> thing. So, um, having a good route around, and Ambrose says, look, there's loads more stuff upstairs as well. Nothing that's really grabbing me. Cool. There was one thing I saw while I was up there, mm -hmm. which was this architectural panel. How much is it before we start pulling it around? Oh, fair, fair enough. I could probably do it for 200. Let's have a look. The first thing that I, I spot that I'm thinking, oh, that's interesting, is a plaster plaque. It's an architectural plaque of a, a, a wreath. They're copied in fiberglass, so I looked at it, I thought it looks a bit fiberglassy from the front. Have a look at the back of it. No, it's dead right. This plaster plaque is around 100 years old, probably French and classically inspired. This plaque was designed to impress in a grand reception room. It could be worth around 350 pounds. 150? Oh, well, I paid more than that. Did it. you? Yeah. Well, you've got to make a profit. I don't want to stop you making a profit. Yeah, yeah go on, 200, we'll take it. Yes, great. That's pretty. Is the way I modeled it added, added value? That added a lot of value. <laughs> Great. Do you want to put it down now? Yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'd really like to pay, like, 160, 180. Uh, it's 200 we settle on. Again, it's close enough not to argue and just get the deal done. Right, there was one thing here in your... your world of bamboo. Yes. <laughs> fan, but fan <laughs> This one, I mean, there's this one here as well, but this one yes. really shouts at me, cos it's a big, beefy one, this yeah, one, isn't it? Yeah, it's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. Um, and I love the marble top. Yeah, the inset um, marble on them. This faux bamboo pot stand would originally have been used to show off the best porcelain or a decorative vase. In the late 19th century, all things oriental became the height of fashion, and hand-turning wood to look like bamboo in quality pieces of furniture like this one was common. French and dating to around 1900, this one could be worth around 500 pounds. So it depends. It depends. It's on price, really, with these, because they're not rare. There's no. lots of them no, around. No. Um, so that one's um, three forty is the best I can do on that. I was hoping you were going to say two eighty, because we're not I talking really loads. Can't. I know. Really I know. can't on that, unfortunately. Drew Pritchard is visiting Relic Interiors in Suffolk, a business built on selling via Instagram. Whoa! Great look. You really love what you do, don't you? Yeah. And he spotted an attractive faux bamboo pot stand. 340 is the best I can do on that. I was hoping you were going to say 280. Because we're not talking really loads. Can't. I know. I really I know. can't on that, unfortunately. It would have to be three, 320. 
The absolute I'll best. I'll take it. I'll take it. The colour's good. It's it's just a nice one. Ambrice is a smart cookie, and she she's making sure she's turning a profit on all of it. She's turning stuff over which isn't too expensive, and lots of it. Well, that is the trick to making money. <laughs> I do buy a lot of fabric. Is that a printed one in the back there? So that's a um, Benison fabric. Um, uh, is it really? Mm. Ooh. How much is that? I don't actually have a price on that one because I use it for decoration, but I can, I'm sure I can come to a price for you. Right now, it's the fabrics that are catching my eye, and she has one in the corner there, which is just a printed fabric, but it's by a very famous company in this country, if you know the name, and you can afford it, called Benison. And it has a huge following because it screams 20th century English country house look. It's great. It's a nice big run of it, and I'm always looking for fabrics. <laughs> Legendary 20th century interior designer and antiques dealer Jeffrey Benison created fabric like this for some of the wealthiest and most discerning customers in the world. Perfect for restoration and reupholstery projects, this length could be worth around £300. Benison Fabrics Tree Parrot printed in England. 1993. 29 years. OK, what's that going to cost? What would you like for that? I could probably do 150 for it. Do you know I'm not going to argue on 150, I'll take it. Thank you very much. £150 paid for the piece of fabric. Right, so if I get a nice ottoman in that's cost me, say, three, four hundred quid, and it's missing a piece of fabric, and that works, it's adding at least the 150 for that one piece. So start doing the math, I reckon I can get four out of it. So, yeah, and I've got it in stock. I might use it next week, I might not use it for a couple of years or more, but I've got it. That piece of fabric could make me a lot of money in the future. Right then, let's let's get loaded. Sounds let's good. Let's get going. Thank you Thank very you. much. No problem. Thank you, guys. It's been great to meet Ambris. You can trade now completely virtually, so you can actually have the whole process without meeting anybody. What's the fun in that? You must make contact with people. You must carry on building up face-to-face -face relations. It's important in this business. Oh, it's been amazing with Drew and T today. Uh, it's been really nice just to see uh, the wealth of knowledge that Drew has, um, really kind of giving insight to pieces that, of my own collection that, he, that I didn't know. Um, so that was really wonderful. It's been a great day. It's been really fun. And Brees was absolutely charming, wasn't she? Yes, what amazing. What a lovely person. Great setup. That's, that's, the, that's how to do it, you know. Really is especially cool. with that kind of quality stuff. Yeah, you know, it, just... yeah. She she's solving a lot of problems for decorators, yeah. you know. Anyway, I was happy with what we bought. We're not going to make money immediately, but the fabric we bought at the end, that venison fabric, will pay dividends. I am happy with that. A good day, and another yeah. contact made. Yeah, an excellent day. Drew has been quick to embrace the latest developments in online dealing in antiques, but some things never change. When it comes to sourcing stock that's fresh to market, there's a staple of the trade that's top of every dealer's wish list, a house call at a stately home. Today, the boys are heading west to the north coast of Cornwall. So today, we are going back to one of my favourite houses in the country and one of my favourite people. We're going back to meet Elizabeth Prido Brun at Prido Place. Lovely, very lovely place. So we went there 10 years ago, too. Did we? 10 years ago. We must have made an impact. They've had it straight back, haven't they? <laughs> Just above the fashionable seaside village of Padstow on the Camel Estuary lies one of Cornwall's oldest estates, covering 3,500 acres. The house, Prideau Place, was completed in 1592, when Queen Elizabeth I was on the throne and is one of the oldest in the West Country. It's still occupied by the Prideau family, who had it built over four centuries ago. When Drew first visited, he unearthed an unusual item of furniture. You need to be a gymnast to be able to do this job, don't you? You do, you need to be a gymnast and a, and a, and a ferret. I think it's been a grain bin of some sort. What, what attracts me to it is the colour. Today, Drew is once again being shown around by the lady of the manor. I'm Elizabeth Prido Bruin, and Peter, my husband, is the 14th generation of Prido to live here. 
it's very strange this house. There are 82 rooms. About 40 of them are just filled with junk. You know, just being chucked in there. And so Drew came for, and um, I learned so much from him during the day. He was an encyclopedia of knowledge on the arts. I was, I, I had such fun. I loved it. Welcome back. Hello, Elizabeth. How are you? Very well, thank you. And you? Good, thank you. Good. Long good, journey. Good. Hello. Hi, Tish. Long journey. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But we're in the area, and we thought we'd come and say hello. Have we all got more wrinkles, less hair, grey? You still look good. Oh. We've not yeah. fared so well. Yeah. <laughs> He's got less know. hair, I've got more. You've got more hair. <laughs> yeah. Can we have a look around again? Yeah, of course you can. I'm going to Come try and buy in. all the things I couldn't buy last time. Okay, Dick. Yeah? This interior, obviously, it's Walpole strawberry gothic influence all over this. Yeah, of course. Cool. And it just doesn't get any better than that. It's good, it? isn't it? Yeah. So, you've great. got to remind me, can I buy anything in here? Because... No. Oh, go on. Sorry. These, I mean, look at, look at these. That really uncomfortable. Oh, really... I know, but it doesn't matter. But look at yeah, them. Yeah, they're great, aren't they? Oh, and there's a cobweb. That's Oops. okay. They all come with those. The rules are that anything that's in the inventory of 1988, when his father died, can't be sold. Mm. So I'm afraid these are all heritage items, so you can't have them. I know. This is what happens with a large proportion, most of the, the big country houses of this country. It means that the pieces can never be sold from the house. It's a double edged sword, it's great for the nation. Bad for antique dealers. So we're now going to what was the coach house. Uh, it's now the garage and also doubles as the junk, another of the junk rooms. This isn't junk. OK. It's not junk. There's a couple of half-decent things in here. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, big of you to say, then. They are. They are. Well, they were. OK. They were uh, back in the day. They're a bit beaten up now. So um, now, unsurprisingly, we are out in the stable block. As soon as I open the door, straight away I can see three things immediately that I'm interested in looking at more. I want, to, I want to know a bit more about those. These may be of interest, okay. unsurprisingly, these grubby old chairs. Just need to check they're a similar size. I'm thinking this one might be a little bit smaller. Oh, is it? They look like a pair. Do you mind if we just hoik no, them no. out? No, no, absolutely helps out. Tea? Yeah, above your head. Do you want me to go out first? <sighs> All right, let's just lay them on its back. On its back, we're not going to... Do any damn more, more damage than already there. Okay, so very good Copen Collinson caster on the back there. Very nice. Yes. Let's get the other one out. There's a pair of 19th century low open armchairs, and they're good. You can tell, very good leg, very good caster, Cope Collinson casters, the Rolls Royce of, of caster manufacturers in the 19th century. They're in a right state. I'd say. But <laughs> worth the journey. Well, they could be. They've got, they've got a good name. A name is there, there. See? What does it say? Holland and Son. Flip it up. Unsurprised to see on both of them Holland and Sons. So extremely good London maker. The quality of what they did was just better than most. To be honest, is up there. It was right up there. Holland and Sons was founded in 1843 and were later granted a royal warrant by Queen Victoria. They made furniture for Buckingham Palace and Balmoral, among other royal residences. This pair of armchairs date to the Victorian period and, once refurbished, could be worth around £2,750. I don't have any plans for them, I must confess. Apart from sending them to vast price to you. Well, I'll buy them. I'm not sure about a vast price, but well, I'll oh, buy them. On. One would be worth very little. A pair really helps it's them good a news. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm trying to... This is why I'm talking so long, because I'm just trying to work out a price. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's funny you say that, because in my head I was thinking, what's he going to offer me? <laughs> um, let's kick off at 600. Oh, OK, quite, Which quite is not interested. A fair, it's a fairish bid. The, it, people go, God, that's cheap. Yeah. There's a 1,000 quid to spend. 750? 700 quid. Done. Sold? Sold. Brilliant. I'm going to carry on. OK. There's a couple more things in here. There's one, there's this table, which is intriguing, but there's yep. something over there, which I'm hoping you can tell me what they are. I think I know what they are. Oh. Um, those. What? Those screens there. I have no idea. I have to be totally honest. Um, I haven't got a clue. If you look on them, right, they've got a scene, a battle scene. Oh. Can you see it? It's hard well, to... I can just see to... fate, yeah. So I'd be I've... really interested in those. Okay. Really interesting to know 
just to get them out and okay. see what the hell okay. they okay. are. Okay, I'll go and see I mean, if I can find... They're really spectacular. Find some manpower. Could see if you can find some manpower, because there's a day bed underneath there. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. So if I... Am I right to just have a sift through this lot while yeah, I can sift. find some manpower? OK. All right. There's about eight or nine things in this garage that I need to see. So, we need some help. Hello, chaps. Here they are. Right. Anna and Rod are here to help so, you. So, we want to move some stuff. This table is of interest underneath it, so... That there. Should we grab... Let's get this one out now? Yeah. Come straight out. Next thing to come out of the shed is a breakfast table. It's mahogany, it's uh, very late 18th century. It's covered in dog scratches. It's about nine different colours cos it's faded all over and marked. But it's utterly charming and I love it. This one I recognised when it was underneath all this stuff. It's rotten, but it's a nice one. OK, Coke Collinson, Pat Caster. And you wouldn't pay any attention whatsoever, apart from the fact... I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's by Howard & Sons. Um, as it stands, uh, 350 quid. OK. Is, is what it's worth to me. I mean, it would cost me a fortune to get it restored. About 1500 to 2500 depending on At which way you want to go with it. At this stage, it becomes uneconomical for me to keep it, yeah. doesn't it? So even I won't restore that. We will clean that frame up, take all the bits and bobs off it, yeah. get it cleaned, repair the caster, right. do that and then sell it as it is. Okay. We, wouldn't, we wouldn't upholster it, we'll let somebody else, because once you upholster it, there's no money left in it. There's a couple of telltale signs that it's a Howard. There's a chamfering to the edge of some of the internal timbers as well and the external timbers of the frame, which was something Howard did for the quality of the way the upholstery moved around the frame when they were finished. And then there's this big black stretcher that goes right underneath. Howard were the only people to do that, notably on the majority of this type of their furniture. The sturdy construction of this early Victorian daybed indicates that it's most likely by the high-end 19th century furniture maker Howard & Sons, who set up shop in London in 1820. By the mid-19th century, none of the nation's great houses were considered complete without furnishings by this celebrated furniture maker. Repaired and ready for the new owner to reupholster, it could be worth around £1,000. This is of interest to me as well. It's beaten up to hell, but it's, it's charming and I'd pay, because of the state, it's in £200. Do you know, I thought that was what you were going to say. Yeah. I'm beginning to read I, your mind. I started at 350 and then I thought, no, it's just not worth it, because the, the state it's in. So that's I mean, if you I'm could make it up to 300 maybe? Just... Drew Pritchard is in Cornwall, revisiting the impressive Pridol place for the first time in over a decade. Have we all got more wrinkles, less hair, grey? You still look good. <laughs> oh! We've not yeah. fared so well. Yeah. He's trying to put a deal together for a Howard & Sons daybed and an 18th century mahogany table. Because of the state, it's in £200. So that's I mean, where I'm at that. I mean, if you could make it up to £300, maybe? Just? Uh, can I buy that? Yeah. If £350 is acceptable on that one, I'll give you £250 for the table. God, you Tight's the word you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. Um, oh, OK. Thank you very much. What we're seeing in the shed is the mentality that goes across the majority of these old country houses and estates and families. They only ever bought quality. So if it's worn out, bashed, stripped down, in a bit of a state, it doesn't matter. It's still good. It's going to be worth something to somebody one day. Put it in the shed. All right, one, two. The extra pairs of hands from the Pridol staff are proving useful. That's it. And I've watched the other painting behind it. Yeah. Watch the other one behind. Oh, God, they're covered in woodwork. OK. Right, now spin it. You had a free spider with it. Yeah, quite a few. Look at that. Looks like leather. This has been cut in from quarters. somewhere else. Yeah. So it's a painting that's been taken from somewhere else and stuck on these. OK. It's not fascinating. The, the thing is, do you want to sell them? Because I'd want to buy them, just for, just for curiosity's sake. Yeah, I can see that. Because um, they're just different. They're extraordinary, aren't they? These two big panels at the back of the room sort of... Now I've got closer to them and I'm able to move sort of face onto them. I'm looking at them thinking, what the hell are these? You know, are they just tapestries? Are they just panels? Because you can't see, they're just flat brown nothing. And then I moved my head and all of a sudden I could see a face and the body of a horse, and I thought, oh, my God, they're paintings. Really big paintings. So I've got to see these. I mean, these are extraordinary. 
just gently. I just want to, don't really want to rub the surface. I'm just trying to not touch the paint and just get the dirt uh, off. look. There's an eye, two eyes. Oh, amazing. All I'm doing is just trying to get the water to just eat through the dust and take the dust off the surface without doing too much damage. Extraordinary. Well, well, well. Painted on embossed leather, these pieces have been remounted on plywood and look like they might have been from the 19th century, but they'll need to be professionally cleaned and assessed to be sure. A pair of paintings of this size and date could be worth around £5,000. I bought some of these near Bath yeah. about three years ago, and I bought six for 1,200 quid. Really? Yeah. Well, these are more expensive. They're rather more finely done. <laughs> no, they're not. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> but if I said to you, for the pair, and there's one bid and one bid only, and I won't pay any more, and it's £1,500 for the pair, and that's it, and Done. I'm stretching Done. myself. Happy? Done. Yeah. Sold? Fine, I'll yeah. take them. I'd, I'd love to see the finished result. Yeah. We don't really know what we've got yet. We know they're two nice, attractive battle scene paintings, and that's really exciting. For £1,500, I've got all that excitement, and there's definitely a profit in them. Right. Where's next? Next is the battery house for the generator. OK. All right. Supposedly, Prido Place was the first house in Cornwall to get electricity. Yeah. Um, so this is what it is. Smooth as a whistle. So here, wow. it, here it is. I have never seen that many battery cases like this ever. It's amazing. These isn't it? are the most I've ever seen one of these in a life. Six or seven oh. in a church in Cumpen Machno. Incredible, aren't they? Wow. The battery house was where the estate's electricity was stored. The diesel generator next door produced electricity that was stored here in a series of interconnected Le Clanchet cell batteries, consisting of glass jars containing an electrolyte solution, a cathode and a nanode. These were then chained together to store electricity for the estate. Electricity was installed at Prideaux in 1905, some 30 years before the UK national grid was born, making the Prideaux battery house and the glass jars in it almost 120 years old. This is extraordinary. Is it? It really is. Man, you just don't see this stuff. This is something... Do you know the... I always say the best bits about our job... Yeah. ..are getting into places that nobody else does. Yeah. When's the last time you came in here? About uh, 34 years ago. I mean, what are I doing here? Excuse me. I think this is the first time we've seen the glass in the battery room as well. I've never seen complete ones. Their old batteries used to be in glass liners. Even some really old cars had glass box batteries. You just see one here, there and everywhere all the time, because they were common. Millions of them were made. But 113 in one room, never seen the like. They're just brilliant decorative pieces. They make the most fantastic um, Vars. flower vases. Could I buy ten? Four fifty. You're on. For ten. Yeah. Happy days. Anyway, right. Right. Okay. That's a really good day. Good. We did and well. It was a good day, wasn't it? It's was a good it? day. We found yeah. some great things. So today, you know, once you start to look through the dirt and the grime and the breaks and the rot and the active woodworm and the bits missing, what do we have? got a 19th century pair of very best Holland and Sons open armchairs. We have got a Howard chaise long. We have the largest collection of those battery vases that I've ever bought. And obviously those extraordinary painted panels, which we are yet to find out what exactly they are. An extraordinarily good day doing the job I absolutely love to do. It's been absolutely wonderful to have Drew and T here. I just love it. I mean, I learned so much. It's really interesting to me, but the things he knows about, you know, the casters on the chairs, etc. You know, just tiny little details that had completely escaped me before. And um, terribly exciting to find those two panels. That was a day to remember. Pulling unbelievably good, wonderful, unfound, fresh to the market antiques out of old barns of a really notable house is just the best job in the whole world ever. It really is. With a boom in online selling and social media, Drew comes across new contacts all the time. And two up-and-coming dealers he's been following have opened up neighbouring shops in the West Country. Keen to be one of the first through the door, 
Drew and T are traveling 140 miles to put faces to names and check out their stock in person. So today, T, we're down in Dorset. We're in Sherbourne, and we're off to see uh, two young lads, uh, Jake and George, both running different businesses. They're fairly, not brand new to the business, but fairly new to both having shops. Interesting facts about Sherborne. Right, Sir Walter Raleigh yes. built one of the castles, yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. I'd, how he fitted time in whilst building all those bikes, I have no idea. <laughs> Situated around 20 miles north of Dorchester, Sherborne's roots go back to Roman times. However, the cathedral was founded a little later, in 705 AD. King Alfred the Great is rumoured to have been schooled in this ancient cathedral, where his brothers are also buried. A well-heeled area, Sherborne has become a hub of the antiques trade, and Drew and T are on their way to meet two of the trade's newest additions. First, they're visiting 32-year-old George Holtby. I'm just trying to put together a collection of interesting things that I'd probably happily keep in my house. Sadly, my house is very small, so it has to go in here and it has to be sold. Particularly, the younger generation are acutely aware of sustainability and antiques fits perfectly within that. I mean, all we're doing is just reusing old things and making them last for longer. And that, because they're so well made, they're, they're built to last. I um, mean, it's nice to keep it all going, you know. Hello. How are you doing? George. Good to see you. Drew, nice to meet you. You've got great things, George. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, Marvelous well... already. I can see nice pieces everywhere. So, if you don't mind me saying, yeah. you're very young. Good yeah. looking, and good looking with a full head of hair. We're not jealous of you. Uh, no, no. But, you know, how long have you been doing this then? Only a couple of years. Yeah, no. and I've only been in here since December. So, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. So um, wow. I've filled it up wow. pretty quickly. These really set it apart. Mm. Thank you. These yeah. give it a bit of an edge. They're plastic as well. So you Which... can't break them. <laughs> Open the door. I'm immediately liking what I'm seeing. Right up my strasser. Good old fashioned English country house antiques with a difference, and that difference is good to see. It looks great. So, I mean, what got you to here then? So, 32... I got a job as a porter at Christie's in London. Christie's South Kent. South Kent, yeah. Well, um, that has been the breeding ground. Christie's South Kent yeah. has been a breeding ground for some of the best dealers of the last 30 years. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, you see thousands of lots a week. Yeah, uh, handle them all. Yeah, 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 it's the best You've got way. knowledge, like a wall of knowledge coming out. Oh, yeah, you. yeah, and just the people there. He, he's realised this is a wonderful, fun job to get involved with. I'm, uh, I'm jealous, cos he's going to get to do it for longer than I am. So you've got some good things here. And the dog's great. Yeah. Can I get it down? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Down. Get down. <laughs> <laughs> That's just on a hardboard. Uh, it's got a... Oh, just a hardwood backing. Yeah. It looks a bit sad, but... Mm. Yeah. My dog did that. Enzo constantly mm. looked sad. Yeah. And then you go, oh, so we get loads of attention and food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All, yeah. Mm. It's a ploy. What are you asking for it? Could be 250. <sighs> 200 pounds? Yeah, that's fine. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. It's just... It's just got something, hasn't it? It, it has, yeah. The frame makes it. Yeah. It's cute. Everybody loves dogs. I'm a sucker for them. George wants 250, I pay 200. We'll do a minor works to it and put it up at 325 to get 300. 100 pounds. That's fine. If there's 100 pounds on the floor, you'd pick it up, wouldn't you? I'm not, I'm not adverse to making 100 quid on something. Tell me about this. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the quality of the dovetails, this quarter is an earring. Um, it's just really tight. It's a clever piece. Yeah. It's yeah. intriguing, it's interesting, but why should we be looking at it? Well, I think it's possibly by Ambrose Hill. There's something I see and it just strikes me. And I'm, I'm looking at what I think is a really early Ambrose Hill sideboard. It's achingly beautiful in its simplicity. It's made with genuine passion, love and skill. And what gets me is the chevron type inlay onto the doors, those four pieces there, OK? That, in the way it's been done, ticked a box in my head. I thought, that's an early piece. Even now, talking about it, the, the hair on the back of my neck is standing up because it's just so damn good. 
A pioneer of modern design, Sir Ambrose Heal has been described as one of the great artists and craftsmen of his time. His grandfather founded the family's furniture business, which is still to be found on Tottenham Court Road in London. Heavily influenced by the arts and crafts movement, Ambrose was passionate about bringing good, well-made, modern design to the middle classes. This sideboard dates to around 1932, and if authenticated, could be worth around £1,200. What are you asking for? It's no price on it. 480. In Dorset, visiting a young trader, George Holtby. You've got great things, George. Thank you very much. Yeah, Marvelous well. already. I can see nice pieces everywhere. And Drew wants to buy a very unusual sideboard that could be an early piece by Ambrose Heel. What are you asking for? It's no price on it. 480. Is it worth taking a chance at 480? Probably. Is it yeah. a great piece of furniture? Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Tea? Your thoughts? Really nice. Yeah? Yeah. Four and a half? Yeah. Happy? Yeah, yeah, fine. Thank Happy. you very much. Thank Sold. You. Yeah, excellent. Absolutely love it. I can't tell you how much I, that's making yeah. me fizz all yeah. over. That is literally, I'm, yeah. I'm like that. Oh. <laughs> all of that history, all of that work, all of that knowledge, all of that style for £450, it's just a really, really good bit of design. Beautifully made with perfect proportion. It's almost Georgian in its mentality. Wonderful thing. A few doors down from George's place is another newly established antique shop run by Jake Wilkie. Hello. Hi, Jake. Jake. Nice to meet you. How are you doing? Very good, thank you. This is great. So, again, a different take. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I'm going to sound so old now. How old are you? 26. Oh my God, you look so young. <laughs> yeah. I feel really old. And uh, I just, I, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys to be at your age and to have it this together is just brilliant. So we've just walked 50 yards down from George to see Jake in the same block of buildings. This is a very good thing to do if you're an antique dealer. Put yourself next to another one, double whammy. It's good for everybody. Do like the mix. It's very, very, very different. Very different. So, what are you asking for the chair? Um, 220. Can we pull that out, T? Can we have a quick yeah. look at that one? I've had a few by this guy, and I, he's, mm. he, he is rated by people who know, mm. and he, I think he's underrated in the, in the wider world. I do think his stuff is... bears a lot more scrutiny. I do think people should be looking at this guy's work. Yeah. The first thing I spot is this wonderful oak and leather chair by Leonard Francis Wybird. Now, a very interesting character. Architect, uh, interior designer, furniture designer. He headed up the Liberty of London Furniture Department and their Decorative Arts Department. So, another late 19th, early 20th century design classic from somebody who really knows what they're on about. That's two today. Ambrose Heel, Leonard Wybird, within 50 yards of each other. That's quite something. Dating from around 1900, this oak and leather chair was made for Liberty of London, a shop renowned for producing fashionable designs for discerning customers at a more affordable price than the high-end arts and crafts cabinet makers of the time. This example could be worth around £450. That's got a nice leather pad, hasn't it? Oh, yeah. I don't know why somebody chose why yellow and somebody blue. Why somebody done that? <laughs> That just, you'd have to dye that. Yeah. You've got to hide that completely yeah, to get rid of it. That's all the cushions there for. What the hell were they thinking? <laughs> what are you asking for that? I mean, what the hell were they thinking? It's They're colour blind. <laughs> Must be. That's the only explanation. It's 200 quid. Just looks so much better. You put that, was that always been there? No. Did you put that on there? Yes. And it comes with that? <laughs> yeah. It can do. So that chair there, he comes in at about 200 odd pounds, I think. It was something like that. But next to it is another chair that I'm struck by. It's a decorated Indian-type throne on black ground with lots and lots of red decoration, a uh, strung seat, which somebody has changed. So somebody in their wisdom has used blue and yellow thread to create a seat. And um, it's horrid. It's awful. It's, it's, it just ruins the whole thing. But then Jake has got a very, very good quality Moroccan leather, leather cushion and put it on top, which makes it. This painted and decorated sling seat is probably Indian and dates to the late 19th century. Sympathetically restored to be more in keeping with its design, 
It could be worth around £350. I like it, though. I like the colour. And how much was this again? It's £220. And you want £200 for that, £420. Can you do £350 for the pair? £370. How's that? Sold. OK. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Try 350, we end up at 370 for the pair of them. Great. Oddly, this is strange, the cushion on that chair is Howard and Sons. That is the type of leather that they use, that Moroccan leather, but of a certain grade and quality. The stitching to around the edges of it is Howard. The weight of the interior of the, the, the down inside as well is Howard. Really good, really good cushion. So I'd have, I'd have paid 200 quid for that. Right, OK. Excellent. We'll go and get the van ready and we'll get this stuff on. Marvellous. Thank you. Right, Thank you. Bit. What a wonderful day. Met two new guys in the trade. You know, I've got a lot of respect for these boys when they come out and get their own money and go out and say, yeah, I'm going to do this and I'm going to have a go at it, you know, because they are entering, without doubt, the best fun job you can possibly have. It's been very, very good for me. It's taken me from nothing to around the world. You know, just my love of what I do and what I see in these boys is the same thing. They have the love and the passion, which you must have, and the interest, and also the get up and go to go out and do it. It's great to meet Jorinti. He's bought a couple of bits. Hopefully he's happy with them. He's given me a few tips, which I'll listen to, and um, he'll be back. All right, well, there you go. That was good. It was. I enjoyed that. Nice lads. Yeah, I was really pleased with Jake getting that uh, Laird Wyberd chair, but buy of the day was definitely the Ambrose Heel sideboard. Yeah, it's lovely. Isn't it? It's so simple, that elegant. Yeah. Exactly. There's the two words to describe it. It's just class. Yes, Do you know what I mean? absolute it's, it's... class, yes. Without shouting about it. Just a very, very good-looking thing. After travelling across much of southern and western England, the boys head back to Conwy with a spectacular hoard ready to be cleaned up and sold on through Drew's ever-evolving online business. In the workshop, Drew's keen to see how the restoration of those remarkable paintings from Prideaux Place is coming along. This is as found, apart from the little face here you can see we rubbed. This one, we're about a third of the way through on. This one has still got to have maybe four more passes with cleaner before it has the finished surface that we're after. Every inch of the leather has been tooled in some way. It's a huge amount of work. So somewhere down the line, somebody paid an awful lot of money for these. So we've got a mountain to climb yet, but when they're done, we will be able to sell them, as long as we can find somebody who's got a doorway big enough for them to go through. This week has been a joy, actually. We went to one of the most famous classic country houses in this country, Prideaux Place, and uh, we had a fantastic day there and found an awful lot of things. I met two young men who are a few years into the business now, and they are an absolute credit to it, and I really look forward to watching their progress through the antiques business. I'm sure it's going to be interesting. And um, Ambrice who was an absolute joy. She is a ray of sunshine and, again, one to watch.